Hey guys, thanks for watching. I had a friend of mine call me this week, said he was running an excavator around a piece of property that he owned when bottles started popping up out of the dirt. Now that got my attention. He sent me a picture, told me that he had left these bottles at the house. So the next morning I got up, got out to the house, as soon as I pulled up, I pulled my camera out because we were going to discover these bottles together. All right, guys, I got a, a tip from a friend. Said I found something kind of interesting. Well, this house that I'm at, um, not the oldest. And I'm not really sure where I'm looking. be honest with you. Well. So I finally figured out what house I was supposed to be at and here are the bottles. I was pleasantly surprised tip from a friend who was doing some construction on a house he owns that he found something kind of cool for me. Looky there. Oh, wow. Wow. Look at that. The Dill Medicine Company, Morristown, Pennsylvania. That is an awesome bottle. That is cool right there. Mm. You can see he popped out of the ground somewhere in here. Wow, very cool. Let's see what else we got. Uh-huh, there's a Charles Hatcher. Castoria. These are so cool. Cork Top Medicine. Maybe medicine. Slug plated. Canbrinus. Stock Company. Cincinnati, Ohio. These are awesome. I don't truly really know what these are. That one doesn't seem to have any embossing. And then an old shoe polish bottle. Very cool. I'm gonna get these loaded up and then look around a little bit more. I love old bottles for the same reason that I love tokens. I've uncovered some really cool old stories from old embossed bottles. Now, that Fletcher's Castoria, that is a very common bottle. I would say if you've dug or looked for old bottles, you got one. They're everywhere. They're so popular, in fact, that there was not one, but there were two B-52 bombers in World War II uh, that were named the Fletcher Castoria. Very interesting choice of names for a bomber. Fletcher's Castoria, if you didn't know it, is a laxative. I don't know. Anyway, 
there's a cool story there. There's a cool story behind that old brown beer bottle. The story of Prohibition. The bottle that I want to talk about is this Dill Medicine Company bottle. Now, I had no idea about the Dill Medicine Company. Could have been a legitimate company, but I was hoping that I'd just run across a little bit of snake oil. Now, what in the world is snake oil? You've heard the term. You probably have a real good idea what I'm talking about. Do you ever watch Andy Griffith? That is a family tradition around my house. Dinner time just isn't dinner time unless we're watching Andy Griffith. It's been going on for years. We love it. And one of my favorite episodes is the episode where you see Colonel Harvey show up with his Indian elixir and Aunt B purchases a bottle or two. And it doesn't take long and Aunt B is completely sauced. She's drunk off of old Colonel Harvey's elixir. It's a great episode. Snake oil salesman. Where did that term even come from? Now, I learned something because I made the assumption that the term snake oil probably went back to something Native American. And I I don't know, I probably read something that they kind of gave, put that thought up here. And it's not completely incorrect. But snake oil doesn't begin with the Native Americans. It actually begins with the Chinese. So you remember in the 1800s as the railroads began to crisscross the country, Chinese laborers were brought in, hundreds of thousands of them. Uh, you metal detectorist, you've probably detected a Chinese coin at some point. Okay, a lot of these uh, Chinese that came in, they brought things from China with them, and one of those things was snake oil. Now, here's the thing. Chinese snake oil was actually an effective medicine. It was from the Chinese water snake. And it was used to treat arthritis. Now, if you're out there swinging a, a pickaxe and a hammer day after day, you're probably going to have some arthritis. So the Chinese would use Chinese snake oil, rub it on those joints, and it was effective. It worked. Well, anytime something works, there's always, always somebody waiting in the wings to profit off of it, to take advantage of it. So the first person that we really see pop up that uh, began to try to market their own snake oil was a guy known as the Rattlesnake King. So what he did was he took rattlesnakes and at one of the World's Fair, uh, he actually cut open a rattlesnake, threw it in a pot, boiled it, skimmed the fat off the top, and demonstrated how he gets his rattlesnake oil. And he claimed he learned this from an old Hopi medicine man. Well, it was complete trash, complete garbage. And he was exposed by none other than Teddy Roosevelt. See, back in 1906, Teddy Roosevelt started something called the Pure Food and Drug Act. The idea was there was a lot of fellas running around selling a lot of salves, tonics, elixirs, potions, and cures. And they made a lot of claims about what was in them. So the government decided to begin testing this stuff to see if those claims were true. So the old rattlesnake oil actually, when tested, turned out to be beef fat, red pepper, and turpentine. This happened to a lot of these snake oil salesmen in the early 1900s, including a guy by the name of William Wright Dill. That's right, from the Dill Medicine Company. Now, William Wright Dill was actually a Civil War veteran. He was a private with the 28th New Jersey, and he didn't even spend quite one year uh, in service uh, before, I don't know if, uh, I don't know if he was wounded, but he, he gets out after about nine months. I think he fought in the Battle of Fredericksburg, um, so he saw some action. But when he gets out, he decided that it's time to go about life and how he's going to make a living, 
So he decides to become a professor. And when I say he becomes a professor, he does so overnight. He never actually goes to school. He didn't study. He uh, pretty much made business cards that called himself Professor Dill. And he began to make these tonics. So the Dill Medicine Company was formed. And some of the things he sold had some great names. One was called the Balm of Life. Now, come on. How can you go wrong with a name like that? Sounds like it's going to fix whatever ails you, right? He also created a cough syrup that was really popular. Dill's cough syrup was a hit. And I can see why when you take a look at what it contains, which includes alcohol, chloroform, and just a wee dab of heroin. Seems like people would probably be on board relatively quickly after taking their first taste of the cough syrup. Well, the old Pure Food and Drug Act uh, kind of bit him in the rear end, too. Some of the stuff that he was selling, you know, he was based out of, I think, uh, Pennsylvania. It was making its way down to Virginia and North Carolina because it was going across state lines. It ends up getting tested, and some of his topical uh, ointments made claims about what it contained, what the active ingredients were, and when tested, it was discovered that actually it contained somewhere between 5 and 15% kerosene, which didn't make him too popular. But you know what? He was fined a grand total of $25, which I'm sure didn't slow him down for very long. What was inside the bottle that we found? I don't know. I suspect possibly the cough syrup. But he also did extracts. I think he did an extract of peppermint. He did, he did a lot of different, different things. But it, it's just a cool story of a time when boy in a good old American spirit guys could be whatever they wanted to be. All you had to do was print out the right business card. Another way that these snake oil salesmen uh, kind of made themselves more legitimate would be to tie themselves to trustworthy groups. Uh, William Wright Dill, he connected himself with the Mennonites. Come on, who don't trust the Mennonites, right? So he was really big in the Mennonite uh, community, and he even donated, I think, a building or a piece of land to them, which they gratefully received from him. He made a ton of money doing this. Uh, and then the other, the other thing that you often see as portrayed in Andy Griffith is uh, they would, uh, snake oil salesmen would often connect themselves somehow with something Native American because it was uh, mysterious and unknown. So there you have it. A little bit of quackery for you. Cool old bottle. Great old story. I love anything that'll teach me a little something. Hope you enjoyed. Hope to be out there soon with a metal detector or looking for an artifact or finding something old for you.